Hallelujah. I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today. It is a very different day today, a very special day. Every day is different on the 11th hour. But this is the day the Lord gave us a brand new song, the song of the seer. Hallelujah. I've never heard that tune before. I didn't know that song. But the Lord gave us that song, the song of the seer. So it is time to see some things today. He wants us to look at some things. He wants us to look at things that maybe we haven't seen before because something brand new is blowing across this open door. See, now uh, people think, well, you know, open door of 2024, yes. Yes, it is. Because in 2024 is in our future. We're already in 23. So in 24... The future is coming through the open door, and it's, it's, it's every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God coming to us. So in the land of 23, the wind of 24 is blowing across it. And so we are actually being nourished by our future. So when you know that and you can live in that, then you start to see things in this wind. Now, <clears throat> I want you to... Um, Think about something a minute. There are four end time players. Yeah, I will, Lord. Let's go over to uh, St. John chapter 1. We'll start there today because that is the place to begin. St. John chapter 1. Hallelujah. Now, in St. John chapter 1, we'll just put it up on the screen if we can so everybody can see it. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, the Word, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. It could not hold it down and seize on it. Now, Lord, I thank you for your Word. And I ask you, Lord, to show us from your written word. Lord, it is the only foundation, Lord, and it is the only one that's strong enough to hold your prophetic words. And, Lord God, without this foundation to stand on and without having it to be subject to, then we end up blown about by every wind of doctrine that comes along. And in the wind that men with slight of hand and craftiness are waiting to deceive your people because they have no grounding of the word. But I thank you today, Lord, that we have your word. And Lord, that we can stand on your word. And there is no other word, no other book, but this book in which there is life. And the only time there is any life in any other is if it contains part of this but, Lord, it's only in those parts it contain that there is even life. So we stand on your mighty word, your complete word, and I give you praise and honor, knowing you were big enough to get us your complete word, Lord, before the end. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, it is time for men and women to quit doing hallucinogenic drugs and trying to figure out and say that there's an alternate universe that they're hearing from God in. Uh, what you've done is open yourself up to demons, and you've created a hopeless situation that you can't escape from. So it's time for you to stop that and quit criticizing men and women of God who hold up this book and say, here is the complete word. Oh, no, there's other words. There's other words. Yeah, there's other words that will send you to hell. This is the only word, in him is life. So go ahead and, and settle it in your heart. This is final authority. Any prophetic word must flow within these pages. This is like the sail of a ship. In here is where the wind blows. This is where the Holy Ghost blows inside this sail. And if you close that sail, there is no other sail in which he can fill and pull your ship along. Hallelujah. Now, in St. John 1, I want you to notice, it says, And in him was life, and that life 
and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. It became a battlefield when Jesus was made flesh. Now watch this, and, and look, uh, look what happens here. Up until that time, Satan almost ruled, except for the prophets. He kind of ruled everything. He had already got a hold in religion. He had already got a hold inside all the religious structure and the high priest and so forth. And it's like a friend of mine wrote me after one of the 11th hours. He said, the church is suffering from EPS, uh, elders, priests, and, and scribes. And so that's what Jesus suffered many things from was the elders, the chief priest, and the scribes. So Satan had got a hold, uh, a foothold in that. Look what it says here, though, in verse 10. and said, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That gives it to every person who receives Jesus as Lord. Don't make any difference what your flesh background was. It don't make any difference if somebody told you you were the biggest accident that ever hit the planet. It don't make any difference if you were born out of some kind of, of, of uh, incest or rape or anything else. You receive Jesus as your Lord, and the flesh and the will of the flesh does not give you uh, the will of the Spirit, and you're becoming a child of God, reigns over any circumstances that you might have suffered in your life. That's good news, my brother and sister, which were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, no matter what situation of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And watch what it says. And the Word was made flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the glory came. And when it came, there was a battlefield that took place. And as soon as the glory was, the word was made flesh, and we beheld his glory, then there was a battle that started. It was like no other. It started when the, they saw his star. When the wise men saw his star, we find out immediately, within two years of seeing that star, Herod is killing the male children, two years and under. Already, it's the slaughter. A, a, a war has taken place. The spirit and the natural has come together in one place and started fighting, and that's in the political. Did you notice that? It was the political. It was handed down by King Herod, kill the babies. It was handed down by Caesar, tax the people. It was handed down, all of this. It was as soon as the glory shows up, then the battle starts in the political. And you'll see it all the way through Jesus' life. And you'll see he suffered many things by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, but he was killed, turned over to be killed with political authority. Now, there are four end-time players in the church. And the Lord spoke this to me, and he said, 2023 has become the battlefield of the glory. This is the year that evil men and women, evil regimes, evil political entities have all made plans. Now, listen to me. Real plans. They've made real plans to hold the light down and seize upon it. They made real plans. It is our time to shine. This is our time. If we don't light a light right now, the Lord has said to me, we have, you have entered the dark ages. As soon as I said that, I was talking to someone on a, uh, uh, that I was on their program the other day, and they said when I told them that, they got kind of quiet. And said that morning in prayer, they had heard that we would look back on this time and remember it as the dark ages. And they didn't know I'd said that. This is, this is the battlefield of the glory. 2023 
is the battlefield of the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is the seven. It is the time of completion. We must finish the battle here so that we can move on into what God has planned. And so now it's moved into the political realm. They're trying to set up one world governments, one world regimes, uh, one way of thinking, one new religion, everything. I want you to listen to this. The Lord said this to me. He said there are four end-time players in the earth. There were four end-time players in the days of Jesus. There was Jesus, the disciples, religion, and Judas. These are the four players. And this time, there is Jesus, or love, who gives the vision. There is the disciples who hear and walk in the vision. There is religion that hates the vision. And there is Judas's that betray the visions. So God has given ministries the time of the seer to see what he wants to do in the earth. And when the seers start to see and have clear vision of what God wants to do, immediately God raises up people like the 11th hour family. There's people that are raised up around a vision that catch it and say, yes, I see it, I see it. And they become like, uh, they become like the disciples of the Lord. They begin to move out with the vision, they carry on the vision, see the vision, talk the vision. But immediately when the vision starts taking hold, religion raises up and hates the vision. Religion hates it. Because it takes it beyond their fossilized thought. That some idea they've carved in a rock that they don't want ever to change. And religion raises up to hate the vision. And then there are Judases that religion can work with to betray the vision. And it is religion that employs political it is religion that employs the political to attack the vision. You have to remember this. And this is where we are in these four end time uh, players. There is the vision God has in the earth, those walking in the vision God has in the earth, religion that hates the vision God has in the earth, and Judases that are betraying the vision that God has in the earth. Four players. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to uh, keep all of that in your mind. I want you to think about all of that. Just keep that in your, in your um, thinking. And I want to, let me find my notes here, some things I wrote down that I want to get said today. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to look over at uh, 1 Kings 12, and uh, we'll look at verse, well, let me get over here with you. 1 Kings chapter 12, and I want to look at verse 25 maybe, 1 Kings 12, 25. Now, before I, I say this, I want to go back to the other. There are those who have the vision, those who work the vision and follow the vision, those who hate the vision and religion and Judases who betray the vision. Now, in this end time play out and on this battlefield of the glory, you've got to decide which one of those four you are. You've got to decide it. See, God will come on the scene and give a, a, a seer, a prophet, something that he wants to do something he says he wants to bring to pass. They start talking. Well, immediately there's people who jump up all around it because they heard the same call when the prophet said it or the prophetic ministry began to declare it. They came up with it. They had it. They're ready to run with it. And then suddenly there are religious people who rise up and hate it and say, you have to sign our petition in order to even have permission to prophesy. That's people who hate the vision. That's religion who hates that vision. 
and they begin to think of themselves higher than they should. They begin to think of it higher than they should. They believe that the, the move and the vision of God has, can never go beyond what they have seen. So how dare you speak beyond our box? Don't speak beyond our box. You know it's only these denominational things. You know it's just word of faith. It can go no further. You know it's just this. It can be no different. It's only these things, and we've built this box to put everything in, and it can go no further. And yet there are people in every one of them that rise up and say, wait, we know it's what we believe, but there is more. I can see more. I can hear it. I smell it. I can feel it. I can see it with the eyes of an eagle coming this way. And they jump on board. And immediately religion in every field steps up and says, no, we hate it. We hate it. You can't Go beyond our box. Well, yes, we can. We can go beyond your box. Boom! Bust out of the box. Suddenly, suddenly we're not just jacking the boxes. We don't have springs tied to our butts. We come on out. And we get out here. They tried to lock Jesus in a political, religious box. They locked him in a tomb. They took his life out of him because they were afraid of his words. They put up, watch now, they were afraid of his words. They were afraid of the pictures it painted. They were afraid of the power it released. They were afraid of his words. So they locked, they killed his words. They killed him. And then they snuffed him out where he couldn't talk. And they buried him in this tomb. And they rolled a huge tonnage in front of his tomb. And then they said, we cannot let his disciples, those that had his vision, carry it on. Because they may say, they, they may uh, steal the body and say he's resurrected. So they employed the political. Who did it? The religion who hated it. Then they get the political, and they slam the political up against the, the stone and say, guard it so that no one can get him out. Guard him against those who had his vision, those who still, still tell his stories. Guard his box. And then you find out what happened. Suddenly. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, and an angel came down and touched his foot to the ground and shook the earth, and the box was opened. And he who they thought they had stopped came out, and the political lay like dead men on the ground around him. And his disciples, who had his vision, he appeared to them all. Hallelujah. But take heed. The Judas that betrayed the vision. You listen close to me. He hanged himself. He hanged himself. And even the tree he hanged himself on didn't want to support his weight. He wanted no part of a traitor. Blair-eyed, money-hungry traitors, Judases, that move into the camp of the saints and betray them because religion hates them. Betray them to the political world. Beware. It's a day of warning on the battlefield of the glory. There are those who have the vision, those who follow the vision, those who hate the vision, and those who betray the vision. And each one had a consequence they had to live with. And Judas hanged himself. He hanged himself. And the tree said, I don't want any part of a traitor. And it broke and gave way. And he fell down into hell, into the valley of Hinnom. And his bowels burst open at the bottom of the valley. And all his corruption ran out. And he went down in history as the, the worst traitor that has ever been. Remember these things. 
It's in the battlefield of the glory. It's in this new battlefield of 2023. We either resist the darkness now, and you're going to fall into one of these. You're going to fall into one of them. And if you resist the darkness now, there'll be some deny, deny what God is doing, but they'll repent too, just like Peter did. But there'll be those who hang themselves. What do you mean hang themselves? A lot of suicides wouldn't surprise me at all this year. But also, they will hang themselves and get caught in their own trap that they tried to destroy the saints with. Beware those who won't let go of religion. You may lose your churches, that you hate the vision. Tear up your prophets list that you make them, try to make them sign. You may not have anything to write on soon. Don't come against what God's doing like that. If you don't understand it, just go ahead and plead your ignorance and say, I don't get it. That's because you're not a prophet. You don't understand it. Hallelujah. Now, 1 Kings chapter 12 in the battle time of the glory. I want you to see this. 1 Kings 12. It says, and this is the story of when uh, Jeroboam went to Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And he, and Jeroboam was also a son, but he was a son of a concubine. And he goes and Rehoboam gets some bad advice from young advisors who didn't know what they were doing. And so... He was going to make the affliction of the people of Israel harder. In verse 19, he said, So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him into the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. Now I want you to know this. Notice this. It said, So when Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, so Jeroboam told all of Israel, come and follow me. Let's leave him alone. So only Judah followed him. But Jeroboam had the other tribes that followed him. Now watch this close. We come down to verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem, and Mount Ephraim, and dwelt therein, and went out from thence, and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now this was a plan he devised. He said, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me, Jeroboam said, and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made, listen to this close, two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, who brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, the house of God, and the other in Dan. He set two golden calves, and this thing became a sin for the people. For the people became a sin, for people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made an house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel, the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart. 
and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burned incense, or burnt incense. Now notice this. He is the king. They made him king, but he's not the king, the rightful king in Jerusalem. And so he has now got his own religion going. Now you need to guard against this this year. The government's trying to create a one-world religion, trying to create their own version to worship, like the Green New Deal that was on Sinai, the Sinai Initiative, where they wrote the Ten Green Commandments, and they and everyone there, uh, the the man came down off Sinai, broke the Green Commandments, and uh, so that we could rep everybody there was repenting, repenting for harming the earth, worshiping the creation more than the creator. Watch for governments trying to do this. Then it says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. So Jeroboam stands by what he's made. He's there to support it. The government now is leading God's people into a new religion, but only a remnant in Jerusalem, in Judah, is serving. Just a remnant. And so a prophet of the Lord comes to confront the king. Whoa. He comes to confront the king. Already the king only established the religion to get rid of, uh, to do, seduce God's people so that they don't kill him and worship the living God. And so this prophet comes along, and he comes up to him, and he cries against the altar in the, in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. Notice this prophet's even calling people by name that will be born. This is going to be the increase on the prophets this year. They will, their insight, their foresight will be, will be so acute. It will get to the point where it's so clear that they will begin to talk about people and names that's not even born. And they'll, they'll begin to see things that's never been seen on this level. And upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burned upon thee. In other words, he's going to destroy this mess. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it uh, in again to him. The altar also was rent. The ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Now, I want you to notice that this year you hear this politicians. You hear this people. I don't care if you're working in government from cities to federal. You better listen close. You're going to try to make the church into your image. When you stick out your hand against a man or woman of God and you send people and say, get them, get them, beware, your hand will wither upon your arm till you can't pull it back again. You remember that. Jeroboam found out real quick he needed that man of God. He said, pray to the Lord for me that my hand be restored. And the man of God prayed and it came back. So you're going to have to decide in this year of the battle of the glory what side you're on. And I'm telling you something, religion, quit working. Quit working 
hating the vision, hating what God's doing, that you're going to work with corrupt politicians. Quit doing this. This year, when you stretch out your hand to destroy the church, it will wither on your arm. And government is going to find out they have to have God's people. They must have the people of God or they will collapse. They will not have their positions. It will start in individuals first, then nations. So you have to find that. And the rest of you that are the prophets that will be walking in such power, read the rest of the story. And do not be diverted from your mission. You'll find that this young prophet was told not to go with the king and eat, not to do this, but to return home another way. And an elder came to him and told him he had heard from the Lord that not what he had heard, but he said, I'm a prophet and I've heard from the Lord, come and eat with me. And the Lord told him not to. And you'll find out what happened to him. You'll find out what happened to, the, to him because he listened to the lying prophet. In verse 11, chapter 13, Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel, the words which he had spoken unto the king. Then they told also, them they told also their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went which came from Judah. He was told to go home another way. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. Now I want you to listen close to what's being said. Listen to the words. Saddle the ass. Saddle me the donkey. Prophets joining themselves to a donkey. So they saddled him, the donkey, and he rode thereon, a lion prophet riding on a donkey. Let that sink in. And went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. He said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? He said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. He said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it is said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. No, he's not as thou art. He's not as that guy was, or he would have been in front of the king speaking. He's not as that young prophet, because he's a liar. He's lying. Or either he was so deluded he believed he heard. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord. Notice to the young prophet the word of the Lord came, but to him an angel spoke. saying, Bring him back with thee unto thine, into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. He's a liar. Prophets. Didn't say he wasn't a prophet. Said he's a lying prophet. He's a lying prophet. He's riding a donkey. He's joined himself with a donkey party. And he's lying. And the young man goes back with him. You ready for this? And it came to pass in verse 20, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God. Wasn't an angel appeared to him this time. This guy's lying to him, even telling him, I'm hearing from angels, man. But at the table, 
the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, this is your harvest, in other words. For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and has not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk, uh, drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass. to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him, and his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it. The lion also stood by the carcass. It will come down to the final thing, the ass and the lion. I want you to think about that just a minute. The ass and the lion, two prophets, and the ass and the lion. This is what's in the battlefield of 2023. You figure it out. You pray and ask the Lord. You pray and ask the Lord. Now, I want you to see this in Numbers 22. Let's go over there. In Numbers chapter 22, this is the story of Balaam. Balaam the prophet. Verse 22 22, 22, and God's anger was kindled because he went. Balaam kept on till he went. And an angel of the Lord stood in the way for, for an adversary against him. Now he, Balaam, was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And Balaam smote the ass to turn her unto the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in the uh, narrow place, there was no way to turn hither to the right or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, He's in conversation with a donkey. Because thou hast mocked me, I would, there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass? Behold, which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day. Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? He said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell on his face. The angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass? These three times, behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way as perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. I want you to notice that here again is another prophet. He's a disobedient prophet. He's a wicked prophet, but he's still a real prophet. And so he gets on an ass. Every lying prophet like that, every deluded prophet, they're trying to, to exalt themselves. They go get on a donkey. They go join themselves to a donkey. And they have this fellowship with this donkey. Are you listening? Well, this donkey crushed his foot. This donkey crushed his foot. So the prophet walked with a limp now. The prophet hobbled along. 
The other prophet got the young prophet killed because he said, oh, no, you haven't heard the Lord. I've heard the Lord sign the petition. He got him killed. And it came down to a lion and a donkey. Put that in contrast with Jesus riding on a donkey coming in and them saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to God, the God in the highest, the King of Israel, fulfilling prophecy. Was the enemy trying to fulfill prophecy? Trying to make himself God in the Old Testament? The thing is, is that we are in a battlefield of 2023. And this whole thing is about to just absolutely explode. We have governments that have absolutely deluded the people so much, they can't even see the truth. We have religious people that hate the move of God because it left them behind. And they're not the ones getting to say all the stuff that the prophets and people are saying. You've got a generation of people that's come on the scene that caught the vision. They are free. They won't be bound up any longer. They're dancing in the churches. They're running to altars. They're praising God. They're speaking in tongues. They're moving out, and nobody is telling them to sit down. And they're excited. Religion hates that. And then you've got Judas's infiltrating churches all over the land to see if they're in compliance to see if they're doing something wrong. Religion sending inf infiltrator operatives, go see what they're doing. Go see if they're doing. This is exactly what they did to Jesus. Well, beware, because this year is the battlefield of the glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's only one real king ever sat on a donkey, and the donkey protected him instead of trying to crush his foot. The rest of them all rode, they were lying prophets, wicked prophets. But this year is the year to master the donkey. Hallelujah. 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 Well, I know. You say, Brother Robin, that's just, you know, you're just, you're just searching for something deep, aren't you? Yes, I am constantly. Constantly I am. I'm looking all the time. I'm looking all the time. I'm listening all the time. All the time. I'm up listening. I'm, I'm up in the night listening. I'm riding in the night listening. Four o'clock in the morning, I'm playing my guitar in my office, listening, trying to hear what's next and what I do next. So if you take anything away from this 11th hour today, know this. There are four end-time players. There are those with the vision, those who follow vision, those who hate vision, and those who betray vision. There is the glory coming in 2023 to do battle with the darkness that governments and people and religion have actually on purpose set up to hold the church down and change it. This is a battlefield this year. There are, there are people, kings, people in high places that will stretch their finger toward the church this year and say, stop them. The church has to have enough power within them to release out of their mouth that their hands wither on their arm and they can't pull it back. It's time this year in the battlefield of the glory that the church prove that our, the government needs us. They need us to restore their hands and their reach again. They need us to bring the living God on the scene. It's all in this year. This year, 2023, the battlefield of the glory. But there is a, a refreshing wind blowing from 24. It's blowing across the land this year. And those who have eyes to see, ears to hear, will see it and hear it and breathe it in. Because rest assured, nothing by any means will harm you this year. Stand and be bold because fake altars will split. 
False worship will fall. All of this will start to happen. I remember several years ago, it can be found. I told because I heard it. The Lord said there's going to be a split in the Methodist church. He told me that. Some of you will remember when I said that. I said there's going to be a split in the United Methodist Church. And the Lord said, I am going, there will still be a Methodist church, but it will be called something else. He said, I'm going to have a Holy Ghost Methodist church. Well, it started then, not long after that, several months. But now today, just the other day I heard, there's over 2,000 churches have left their conference, and they call it the Methodist Church Split. This year, fake altars will fall. You cannot place homosexuals behind the pulpit. You cannot put what God has called an abomination in the place to preach the blessing. You cannot put them in your choirs. You cannot put them as your ushers. You cannot use them as anything within your church. You can't. You can welcome people to come to your church, and you can preach the truth. But you can't allow such acts to come in your church and then make out in front of the children in that church. You can't desecrate the holy place. You can't allow that. You can't allow equal religions to come in your church and call them equal. You can't allow Chrislam. You can't allow things to come in your church and let someone who is a Muslim or a Buddhist or something stand up in the holy place and proclaim something that you have. They are proclaiming equal to the word and to God. You can't let anything exalt its idea equal to Jesus. He is the only way. A couple years ago, this survey is probably this old now, 80% of the Christians don't believe Jesus is the only way to heaven. Then what does that leave in the church? When you have Christians standing up saying, love is love, love is love, why don't you love love? Why don't you describe the act of sex between two homosexual men? Describe it to the minutest detail. And let's see how much love everybody around you thinks that is. People say, oh, love, we just love. Every, it's okay if they love. No, no, it's an abomination and it's a seed killer. That's why it's an abomination to the L-O-R-D, all caps, is because it's a seed killer. That's God in his system of harvest, and it produces no life. That means it has to just produce death. You've got to draw the line this year. It's a battlefield of the glory. Love those that are in those lifestyles, but don't love the lifestyle because it is a mask for a real call that is on their lives, which is evangelism. You're probably looking at a real evangelist. And Satan has seized the call because no one told them their identity. No one told them that. The church has got to rise up and be the church. You, ca you can't just keep doing this in the time of the battle of the glory. Darkness has planned to seize the light and hold it down. Don't let abominations stand in your pulpits and preach. Don't, don't accept lifestyles of any kind of lifestyle. Well, you know, these people, they may be wife beaters. They may beat their wives at home, but, you know, her bruise heals pretty quick. And, you know, they're a deacon of the church, and, and you know, they hold a high position. Well, I know they're alcoholics, but, my God, I mean, they really don't hurt anybody but themselves. 
So why don't we just let them, you know, they can be uh, Deacon Haynes or somebody. They can stand up and be uh, Deacon Elrod or whoever they may be, or or they can be uh, uh, Elder Rodney and, and uh, you know, an apostle uh, whoever and Pastor, uh, you know, Pastor Benjamin. Oh, Pastor Benjamin. Yeah. He only freebases cocaine every now and again. He's okay. You're letting these things just stand in the podium. Get in the choirs. That was a friend of mine years ago. He used to be a pickup man for the mafia. And uh, you couldn't scare him. You just couldn't scare him. He just wasn't afraid. And... He talked through his teeth like this. He just always, he talked like that through his teeth. And he loved the lost more than anybody I've ever met in my whole life. He was hard acting. He was real to the point. But he would weep over lost people until tears had rolled down his face. And he, you know, he wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't, people wouldn't let him preach in their church. Because he, his mouth was, he was too blunt about a lot of things. And uh, he, he talked to me about a lot of these meetings he would have. So he had to get himself a tent because nobody would let him come in. So, you know, he set up his tent one time in this certain place under this bridge. And... Uh, he had set his tent up, him and his little wife, and I knew her, Robin, and I knew her too, the kindest, precious, most precious woman. <laughs> They're just the opposites of each other, just, and so they were really good together. And so he, this guy came up and said, you ain't preaching here, preacher. And he had this guy with him and had a beret on and camouflage and had an M16 in his hand. And he walked up and said, you ain't preaching here, preacher. And my friend says, yeah, we're going to preach. Yeah, yeah, we're going to preach. I can still see him. Yeah, yeah. And he started walking toward the guy with the M16. The guy's standing there like he's in command of everything, you know. And he starts walking up through there. And he gets up to him. He said, I remember my drill instructor. We'd be standing with our rifles. And if he could get up to you and snatch it out of your hand, you was in trouble. Because most people don't have a real grip on it. And so he walked up there, and he said, yeah. Yeah, and he got close enough to him, and he snatched that M16 out of his hand. The guy's eyes got big. He just turned around and opened up on that overpass above the tent. And when he did, he emptied it and threw it back to him. He told him, he said, now, I tell you what you're going to do. You're going to go into town and get 10 gallons of white paint, and you're going to come back out here and paint over all those vulgar words across that overpass, and we're going to have church. They went to town, got the paint, came back. Can you believe that? Well, he was in a tent meeting one night, and the pastor had been, you know, invited him there and everything. And, and then he's coming around the tent. And if I'm mistaken, it was the pastor's wife came around the tent, and they met walking around the tent, and the devil manifested in his, the pastor's wife. She started spitting green ice out of her mouth. Just started like throwing up green ice and just spitting it out of her mouth, ice cube looking things. When they did, my friend said, yeah, and grabbed her by the ears and started casting the devil out of her. And the next thing you know, him and the pastor's wife was rolling across the ground, him casting the devil out of this woman. They caught that green ice in a jar and saved it to show everybody. Now, this was a pastor's wife. Now, you think about it. Some of you in your churches, one day you're going to get somebody real anointed like that in your church. Now, what did she come in contact with that made that thing manifest? She came in contact with someone who loves souls more than anything on this planet. He had the heart of Jesus, even though he had the mouth of Peter. 
he, uh, he, he came up and that woman suddenly manifested that devil. You know, Jesus would go into church and devils would scream out. Some of you sometime are going to have somebody standing in a podium. You're going to put up some, uh, somebody who's, who's come in, you know, that the world would call some butch or something. You're going to come in there and they're going to stand up in a podium. And they're going to stand up there. going to be some man in drag maybe standing up in the podium. They're sending people, men dressed in drag into our schools, twerking in front of the children in drag. Some of them let them up in their podiums, in their churches. You're going to have somebody like that one of these days. And somebody anointed is going to walk in the door and they manifest a devil right in front of everybody. I mean, next thing you know, they're laying over the podium, rolling out in the altars and, and everything. And then the next thing you know, four or five people in the choir, three or four of them throwing up green eyes because the whole church is demon possessed. I wonder why we can't fight the forces of the Antichrist. I remember one time I was standing up preaching, and this, this was an old church, and I'm standing up there preaching, preaching, preaching. And all at once, this guy walks up and he does this, and his hands are all gnarled up, and he holds them out, and his eyes are about that big. And he just holds them out like that to me. And everybody's looking at him. And all of a sudden I said, I'm asking the Lord, you know, what do I do? What do I do? The Lord said, hit his hands as hard as you can. Just jam them together like that and tell that thing to leave. Bang, I hit his hands, man, call that spirit out. What I did, he hit the floor, rolling across the floor. And then he gets up delivered. Later the pastor's wife asked me, said, what was that? I said, that was a devil. She said, oh, no, it can't be a devil. He's our piano player. I said, well, your piano player had a devil. And sure enough, he did. I remember I was down in a church in a mining camp one time, and I'm just laying hands on people, praying for them, and I come by one of the deacons in the church. He's about this tall. He's a, a small frame man, and I just laid my hands on him and said, be blessed, and all of a sudden he throws his head down. He starts hissing, slobbering out of his mouth. His, he starts hissing like a snake, and the pastor and the youth pastor are trying to hold him, and he's bouncing them around, and then I, I walk up to him and command the devil to leave him, and in front of the whole church, one of their deacons hit the floor, started crawling and swirling like a snake, called the devil out of him. He gets up free and don't even remember doing any of that. A deacon, a pastor's wife, piano player. How long is it going to be before one of them manifests in the pulpit? It's going to happen. There'll be somebody come in so anointed that that person standing in that pulpit, all of a sudden a man takes his drag wig off and looks like a fool in front of everybody, and the next thing you know, man, they're ready to, I mean, he's manifesting this devil. This thing, these things are real. The power of God is that real. You've just never seen it, a lot of you, in real life scenarios like that. I have. I've heard them cry out in the altars, demons crying out of people, and the power of God would get so strong. That's what they did with Jesus. Jesus would go to church, and as soon as he'd go to church, devils would cry out and say, we know you, who you are. Well, this thing is about to get this real. Now, listen close to what I'm telling you. This turned up in 2023. The power is going to turn up this strong. In 2023, it's going to be where prophets, pastors, apostles, uh, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers are going to become so anointed that they are absolutely going to turn their churches upside down. And people will fill them up to their standing room only while others have no one. Because you cannot, you can't, you're either going to take sides in this battle this year. You're going to side with the darkness 
or side with the glory. But 2023 is the year that they'll tell the story in the ages to come. It was the battle of 2023. I thought 2023 was going to be wonderful. It is. It's the year we get to step on the devil over and over and over and over and show the power of the living God. It's the year the wealth transfer will begin to come to you instead of the darkness. It is the year for the battle of the glory. Hallelujah. It's the parallel year to John 1. Amen. Well, Krista, come on and receive our offering today. Uh, Krista says, I always hand her the mic after something like that. So <laughs> come on and, re and receive our offering and tell the people how to prosper. Yes. And, and you know, and here's the thing. My brother and sister, you have to remember something. I could say no prophecies and no words if I was saying it out of hate. I'm not, I, that's not my motive. That's not what provokes me. If I think I'm just hating on somebody, then I just won't say nothing. But you have to remember, people that are in bondage, God wants free. And sometimes you have to see the bondage before you can see the freedom. You know, people say, well, if, you know, you kind of have to be lost before you can be saved. You don't even know you need salvation if you don't know that you need it. You know, I remember Norval Hayes one time. He, he called and out to the church. He was in a first church. I won't say what first church because I really don't know which church it was. But he was in some first church, you know. And uh, I don't know what that says for the second ones, but the first ones, you know. And so he stands up on the stage, and he said, the Lord has told me. It's Sunday morning service. He said, the Lord has told me. And the Lord told him, said, now there's homosexual in this service that I won't deliver. So the Lord had a reason for the, he had a purpose for this young man. He said, I want him delivered. And Norval said, all right, Lord, I will minister to him after the service in the back room. And the Lord told Norval, said, I don't have any backroom ministries. He said, minister to him right there. So he lined up in the altar, all of them, a bunch of people, and this one young man stuck out uh, to him. And, the, and Norval told him, said, the, uh, it was Norval Hayes, I'm thinking. Of. The, Lord said, the Lord said, you are a homosexual, is that right? He said, yes. His eyes were big. Well, he wanted free. Norval, as only he could have said it, said, your boy kissing days are over. And he took his fist and hit him right in the stomach. The boy bent over and was completely free of all of that. See, that's a bondage. And it's holding down the most precious souls of people that anyone has ever seen. Because they are people that when, when people... Uh, they have a call of evangelism. Like, you know, my friend was an evangelist, and he loved souls. And that's the heart of an evangelist is the love of souls. And so think about it. That's why the homosexual community is so vocal, so activated, because they're really evangelists. And so the Lord wants his army of evangelists coming out into the freedom of his call and know their identities. Hallelujah. But at the same time, remember this, people that are bound up in any kind of bondage in the battlefield of the glory is not going to be fit for service. Not if you're bound in it and you're not looking to get free. You cannot. It's like one pastor told uh, a major preacher that we, you know, he, he told him, he said, he said he was up on stage and he, he got to smell it and he smelled pot. And he went into the pastor's office and the pastor was sitting behind the desk. He walked in and said, do I smell pot? 
the pastor said, oh, yeah. He said, man, I, I just do a little of it before I preach because it mellows me out and lays me back a little bit. <laughs> now, this is stuff that has to stop. It's the stuff that has to stop this year, right now. Hallelujah. And we'll come back in just a minute. We're going to pray for any addiction to be broken, any bondage to be free, whether it be drugs, violence, pornography. I don't care what it may be. We're going to pray and break it off of your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Go ahead, Crystal. And once again, hand me the mic. <laughs> Praise God. Well, we're, I'm not going to hold you long because that is, I esteem that higher than the offering. And that's getting you free. Getting you free so that you can serve during this time. Because we need you. We do. We need you. And so stick around. You know, this may be a time right now that you might could call somebody. Text somebody, call somebody, and tell them to tune in. Tune in right now so that that way they're, they're watching. And this gives you time to do that also. That way that we can, we can pray and we can stand with you and we can believe with you, your friends, your loved ones, whoever. There was somebody that came up in, in your spirit when I said that. So if you want to do that, I, yeah, I encourage you to do that during this time. You know, uh, with this coming up this year, the, the next couple of years, he, he was talking about different people and, and their roles and what different people are, are supposed to do. And then there's these people and then there's that, those people. And there are also people, and I've taught on this before, there are people who are called to encourage the move of God, to encourage it with giving. There are people who are called to do that because there are people that they don't want to travel the world and, and minister. They're, they're, they're fine right there in, in their hometown or in their field of, you know, and anything can be your ministry field. Anything. I've met tattoo artists who that was their ministry field because they said, what better time to minister to somebody when I have a needle stuck in their skin and they're laying there, you know, as still as, as a corpse. We, we literally need everybody. There's doctors and nurses that are called, and that's their ministry field, that they go in and they pray with the patients and they talk with them. They give them faith and they give them hope. We need every field. We need attorneys who are spirit-filled. We, we need e everybody. Just because you don't stand behind a pulpit does not mean that you're, you're not called to minister. Every single person is called to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But it doesn't mean necessarily that you physically have to go. Sometimes... You just support those that do. You know, we support ministries that do something different than what we do because we're not going into that field. So we support them so that they can go, and then we know that that's us going. That's us going. And so there are, and I'm not standing up here saying, give to the 11th hour, give to this ministry. No, I'm telling you, period. Listen to where God wants you to sow. Listen, because it, that, that may be your job in these next couple years is to help, uh, to encourage this move of God to do that. And so where you know where the Lord has led you to give. You know where he's led you to sow. And if it's this ministry, then you know what? You're going with us every single place we go. Everywhere we go. Wherever the Lord calls us to go in ministry over the next couple of years. And we're just, and this is just this is just saying the next couple of years. This is forever. But just over the next couple of years, you went everywhere that we went. Every single place. Every soul that was saved, that was you. Every person that was set free, that was you. And so this is the way we feel when we give to other ministries. 
is I think, you know what? Every every single person that they that they ministered to and they got delivered out of this lifestyle, that was me. That was me, praise God. They went somewhere that I couldn't go. But you know what? In the, in the spirit world, I was right there. I was right there. And so that is the way we truly feel about our partners here. We truly feel that you go with us every single place we go. Every, and you can call on all of that. You can believe. All, uh, you, this is true. This is true stuff I'm telling you. And so I just want you to know that that is the way that, that we feel and that that is in our hearts. And, you know, and I love getting testimonies from our partners and, and hearing things that are going on in their life. Like this one girl messaged me not too long ago, and she said I had given the, the story about the 65 cents that the Lord leads me to do every single year just at different times. And so... She said, after you spoke last week, I asked the Lord what he wanted me to sow because the whole message is about asking God what he wants you to sow and sowing obediently, whether it's 65 cents, whether it's $65, whether it's $6,500. It's all about obedience. That's what's going to get you the harvest. Not letting it go, going, well, there goes that $40. I'll never see it again. You really expect the harvest off of that? There was no faith in that. There was no faith at all. So this girl messaged me. She said, after you spoke last week, I asked the Lord what he wanted me to sow, and he said $40. And I sowed it and then called the wealth transfer to me and my family and said our address. Five days later, I received a package in the mail with $400 in it. Not only that, but $400 for my sister's. And $300 in gifts. Now, she gave that offering obediently. She asked the Lord, what do you want me to sow? And he said $40. You know, some of you may be thinking, $40 ain't much. I give that $40 right now. But did God tell you to give that? It don't matter if you've got $4,000 you could get rid of like that. Did God tell you to do that? Obedience is better than sacrifice, and it is the way to go, trust me. And so I just want to encourage you today, listen to the Lord, because that, that's not my testimony, that was somebody else's. And so if it can happen for me, it can happen for her, it can happen for you. Hallelujah. And so remember, some of us are called during this time to encourage the move of God. So ask the Lord, am I called to encourage the, the move of God? Not just pray. Now, there's different ways of encouraging the move of God. By praying, by interceding. There's just different ways. But then there's in your giving also. And in reality... We're all called to encourage it with our giving everywhere, all around the world. And so every time you sow a seed, not only is it just for your life, for your increase in your finances, every time you sow a seed, you say, this is my encouragement to the move of God. I'm telling you, it, it will make you even more excited to give. Uh, trust me, it will. You'll be able to give and go, This I'm encouraging this move of God right here. So anyways, that's what the Lord has. It, it gets quiet in the 11th hour studio. I think everybody's trying to process what everything was said. So go back and listen to this. But we're going to pray over your giving right out of the scripture, right out of the book of Luke. In Luke 6, 38, it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Now, if you're a tither in Malachi 3, 10, it says, Bring ye all the tithes, 
tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done, in Jesus' name, amen, praise God. We got praise reports? Praise God. Praise the Lord. You know, the first one I had, it's no coincidence you read that testimony today about the 65 cents, because this is the first praise report I have on my my list today, it says, I listened to Krista testify about giving her last 65 cents, and the Lord blessed her in return with $650. My husband and I were in a situation where we were down to our last dollars, but I knew we had to step out in faith. I quickly prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to show me an amount, and I heard $20. When I opened my eyes and looked down, I had the Bible open to one of the books, and it was specifically on chapter 20. I went ahead and tied the $20. About a week later, I received a check that had been held back of $20,000. It had been held back for months, and I was beginning to feel like it wasn't going to happen. She said, at a time where I felt most defeated is when the Lord stepped in and blessed us. She said, it's time to go tithe again. (laughs) Amen. Amen. This next one, and I, I could relate to it. A partner wrote in and said, hello, Just a praise testimony to God's awesome goodness. I was headed home yesterday from having been being snowed in at work for a week due to a major blizzard that had occurred in my area of Nebraska. On my way home through some hills, it was pretty slippery, and I was taking my time very carefully. There was another pickup truck behind me. So going down the last small hill before the flat stretch of road, I had slowed down some since it was a hill and it was not uh, not open too widely. Uh, the pickup truck behind me began started to slide sideways and was close to hitting me and another vehicle that was coming from the other direction. I didn't panic, but I held my breath, and all I said in my thoughts was, Lord. I felt my foot press into the gas pedal only slightly, but it was enough to stay ahead of the guy behind me to get straightened out without wrecking and avoid hitting me. First thing out of my mouth when I found my voice was, Thank you, Jesus. I have no doubt it was supernatural divine protection because that pickup could have rammed me from behind and pushed me into the oncoming car. So praise the Lord that he He is our protection during snowstorms, tornadoes, whatever's going on. We call out his name. You know, that happened to me a couple of years ago. Um, I was on my way home from work. They didn't dismiss us in time. And if you live in Alabama, you know, when it threatens to snow, everything shuts down. Well, they didn't dismiss us from work in time before the roads iced over. And if you live in, around Birmingham, you know, coming down a certain stretch of highway in Green Springs, it's a solid hill that comes all the way down to the bottom. Lots of traffic coming down this highway. I was seven and a half months pregnant with my son at this time in a front-wheel drive SUV. It was one solid sheet of ice from the top of the hill all the way to where the road straightened out. I slid through the first red light and came all the way down the hill. There was not one solid car on the road with me. I just slid all the way through the red light, and I didn't panic. All I said was Jesus the whole time. Made it all the way home, riding over ice and snow, pulled up in my driveway that was a hill. No problem, never slid, and got home safely. So praise the Lord. When something comes up, you call his name. Amen. Amen. And we had multiple ones. I'm not going to read them all. We had multiple reports where people's legs and knees have been healed watching the program. People who had severe swelling or or knee problems, foot problems, ankle problems have wrote in and said they watched the program, got up, and have done things they haven't done in years. Walking around, being able to sit and stand for long periods of time. So we praise God for your healing today. Thank you so much for writing in your praise reports. Continue to send them so that we can rejoice with you. Send them to robindbullock.com. Call us. Let us know where God is moving in your life. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, you know, I uh, hook up Judah for me, would you? I, uh, I was 
just thinking, sitting over there thinking about it, like Krista said, I was real quiet. I'm usually, you know, a lot kind of vocal when she's preaching, and I, but I was real quiet about things because I was thinking about deliverance for people. And I was thinking about uh, how right now is the time for people to be delivered. This is the time, I believe that today, we're going to have multiple categories of people delivered. See, I think of the five-fold ministry. That's just like, you think about it, people that are in Islamic uh, beliefs like that, they're actually called to a part more than likely of God's five-fold. They're, they're called into his ministry. And, and you, you have people that are just you know, different ones, and like we talked about in the homosexual community, they're actually evangelists, and God is going after his army of evangelists. It's time to see them free. Uh, people on drugs that are just bound up, they're, they're, not, they're not wicked, evil people. They just, their flesh is hooked on something they cannot shake, but their heart still cries for God. This is a real thing. I knew a man that was in the ministry, and he was a well-known man in, in music ministry. And he would lay on the floor of the tour bus, of their tour bus, and he would cry and weep because he was hooked on cocaine and things and go in there and minister and preach and sing and see people born again and go back out and weep before the Lord because he couldn't kick that out of his flesh. So today, if you'll play the piano, just something for me. I, 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 we don't want any soft. Just begin to do it. And you can do that any time you like. Hallelujah. And pray the mysteries of God. Well, until next time, we gather together right here around God's Word. I want you to remember, never forget... God is absolutely good. Shalom.